At this point, I am going to hand the program off to uh, Dr. Haley, and he will introduce the uh, Student Science Summer Internship Program. Thanks, Dr. Haley. So today we're going to hear from five students who spent their summer engaged in genuine scientific inquiry in the context of a summer internship. And although you may not understand every single thing that they're going to say, I hope that you do get a sense of the kinds of opportunities that are available to those of you who are interested in pursuing science and engineering in college and beyond. So each of them has prepared a short presentation which summarizes their experiences this summer, so please give them your full support and attention. Uh, first, I have the pleasure of introducing Scott Burstein, who had a six-week research institute for mechanical engineering at the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience Machine Shop, where he was trained by expert machinists to design and create custom parts using a CAD program called SolidWorks. These parts were then used in cutting-edge neuroscience research at the Institute. Scott focused specifically on designing and building a syringe pump for the perfusion of cell culture media. Scott Burstein, come on up. Uh, hello guys, so um, before I begin just with like the nitty-gritty of my project that I did, I would just like to talk to you about sort of like how you can get involved in doing like an internship like this. So like I think a common misconception is that you like need to already have experience doing something like to have an internship, but like I didn't have any experience really in a machine shop like besides being a part of the engineers. So you really just need like an interest in science to uh, be qualified to have an internship like this, so just keep that in mind. Sorry, technical difficulty. <laughs> um, it's not space bar. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so, like, I built a syringe pump, which is used to uh, exchange uh, different liquids in a cell culture sample. So when you're studying a neuron, you need to have it be alive underneath the microscope. And it, like, you can't just like take a slice of a brain and put it under a microscope and expect it to continue firing at the neuronal level without um, adding some like liquids to sort of represent um, a homeostatic environment like you have in the brain. So the goal of my project was to design a syringe pump to um, enable the perfusion of this media. Uh, so in, a, in the brain, there are all these neurons. And so the, the way the brain works is that these neurons communicate with each other by firing at um, at different dendritic spines. So at the input end, you have um, sort of the axon terminal, which receives a signal from another neuron. And this is how the brain communicates with itself and the rest of the body. So you have to, like I said, you have to take fluid and replace it in order to maintain this environment. We can skip this for now. Yeah. Okay, so my syringe pump um, is a replacement for a costly perfusion systems, which, which work, but the problem is that you can't really program it to do a, like a specific task, and they don't really uh, enable scientists to specialize um, the cell's environment for a specific experiment. So by using just a syringe pump, you can put the exact amount of fluid that you want, as opposed to having a perfusion system, which um, sort of limits the amount of, uh, limits like the, the range of experimentation that a scientist has. Yeah. <laughs> so, the requirements for this build were that um, it had to be really easy to use, pretty small in size, 
and it had to convert the rotational movement of a motor to the linear movement of a syringe plunger. So if you've ever seen a syringe, you know that you can push fluid out by moving the plunger forward and backwards, or to, if you take in fluid, you pull it back. But um, this requires a scientist to be present at all time, and contrary to popular belief, scientists do go home at the end of the day. So if you need to like uh, maintain a cell's environment for a long period of time, you're gonna need some sort of automatic method of doing this. So I designed these parts um, uh, sort of to be, so you can take it apart and you can use like all different size syringes on the same pump, which is a little bit different than um, if like it was all one piece. So by just changing like a few parts, uh, actually these three ones that are shown here, you can use anywhere from like a one milliliter syringe to a 30 milliliter, even like a 60 milliliter syringe. And I designed the necessary parts to, to use any of these size syringes. And I designed all these parts using SolidWorks, which is the industry standard in CAD design. So any machinist, um, or most machinists use uh, SolidWorks to design their parts just because it really doesn't have any other match for the amount of uh, customization and sort of, um, uh, it's like the most precise software out there. So that's why all the machinists use it and that's what I was able to work on uh, at Max Planck. Okay, so um, I had a few um, sort of uh, hurdles along the way. So I actually designed a completely different version using a, a gear rack, which is a more common way of converting the rotational movement of a motor to the linear movement of a syringe pump. But this had a few issues um, such as size because first of all, the motor would have to stick off um, the side of the base plate, which took up a lot of room. And also when it was out, the gear rack um, sort of protruded out over the base plate, which, which was an issue. Uh, yeah, and I, I've made an animation of what my, my, uh, my final design looked like. So if you can play that. <laughs> OK, that's fine. Um, but what, <laughs> what you can kind of see is that uh, the motor at the end, it rotates, and then that mid-central rod, it's actually threaded, which means that as the motor rotates, it causes the uh, sliding piece in the middle to move back and forth, which is attached to the plunger end of the syringe. So as the motor rotates one way, that'll cause the um, plunger to move back and forth, which will then take in and remove fluid uh, from the syringe. Yeah, so I designed all these parts in SOLIDWORKS, like I said. I then made the cylindrical components on something called a lathe, and all the irregular ones on a five-axis CNC milling machine. It was really a privilege to be able to use uh, a five-axis CNC milling machine because so few places have access to them, and Max Planck actually had two. So I was able to get a lot of hands-on experience using these uh, machines, which very few machine shops even have access to. And I then assembled these parts using standard metric screw sizes. Um, and the picture at the bottom is what the final product looked like. So the results were um, a simple uh, syringe pump, which allows anyone to uh, take in or remove fluid from a sample. It was extremely accurate, so I have a few numbers. Sorry. Yeah, so about... <laughs> So one rotation of the motor can be divided into 200 steps. So a step is like the smallest amount that the motor can rotate. And so one step for a 60 milliliter syringe pump uh, with like regular friction will be about 2.2 microliters. And for those of you who aren't familiar with microliters, it's one millionth of a liter. So it's extremely accurate. And um, one of the other interns at Max Planck, Philip Taylor, he actually programmed the motor used so by the end of our six weeks, we made a, um, a product that, that was working, which was nice. <laughs> oh yeah, so I've pretty much gone over this. It's, I made uh, 
why, why I included this picture is because um, this syringe pump will actually, the syringe pump will fit inside um, uh, uh, like a, a, a microscope. So it fits right in there and then it removes and um, puts the fluid into the sample to keep the sample alive while you're taking images of it underneath the microscope. And I would like to just thank the entire MPFI community for just teaching me so much. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Aliga for just um, being there and helping me out with the application process. Um, really, if you have any interest in a science internship, talk to Ms. Aliga. I know she, she'd be more than happy to help um, you get any sort of internship, whether at Max Planck or at Scripps or somewhere else. So thank you guys. Okay, next up is uh, Jake Lazar, who worked at the Scripps Research Institute for six weeks this past summer. He worked in Dr. Min Guo's cancer biology lab under the tutelage of Dr. Haipang Wang. The lab is focused on the role of amino acyl tRNA synthetases in cancer biology. He worked on a project that aimed to find the structure of a protein complex that was useful in the study of Resveratrol, which is a molecule that is potentially beneficial to human health. Jake, come on up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Dr. Haley said, I worked at Scripps this summer for six weeks, and a lot of what I did is very technical, uh, so I will try to uh, go through that pretty quickly. So in the lab that I was working in, we were focused on the role of amino acyl tRNA synthetases in cancer biology. And so what that actually means is basically there are things that regulate some of the functions of the body. Uh, but specifically within the lab, I was working on a project uh, that was uh, involved in trying to find the Tyrus Park 1 complex structure. And you'll see why that's important in a little bit. But first, I should introduce resveratrol. So resveratrol is a molecule. It's found in grapes, blueberries, and a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables that have been considered beneficial to health uh, for, for centuries. And no one actually knew why they were beneficial necessarily. And so uh, now that we've found this molecule, we may have found the, the answer to that. And so on the bottom left in that image, you can see why resveratrol, why we think resveratrol is beneficial. Uh, so, on the far left, that is the liver of a mouse that was fed a standard diet. In the center, that's the liver of a mouse that was fed a high-calorie diet. And then on the right is the liver of a mouse fed the same high-calorie diet, but also included a dosage of resveratrol every day. And so you can see that the one with the high-calorie diet and the resveratrol looks similar, if not the same, to the standard diet mouse. And so recently, new resveratrol research, new research into the subject has found that resveratrol actually binds uh, tyrus, which is a protein, and PARP1, which is an enzyme. Uh, so when they're together, resveratrol helps with the binding of these two processes, uh, of these two molecules. And so we were trying to basically find why resveratrol works. That's the, that's the goal, is that eventually we want to know why resveratrol works. We know to a basic extent that it does, but we weren't sure exactly why, and so perhaps knowing the structure of this complex uh, would give us some clues. So the goal was to find this uh, complex in the middle, uh, there, the PARP1 tyrus resveratrol complex. And so there were several steps in trying to find that. First, I should introduce crystallography. So crystallography is the science of studying crystals. And really, there are three steps. Basically, there are three steps, but it's, it seems complicated. Uh, the first one is that you actually get the salt crystals of the molecules. And so you see that in the photo on the left. The step in the middle is the diffraction step. And so what you do is you shine a very high concentrated light at a molecule, and what you get is a lot of little black dots. Uh, and 
basically what a crystallographer can do is, you know, through years of training and lots of years of college, they can transform that little black dot structure into that structure on the right, which is the actual structure uh, of a protein. And so how we were going to try to find a stable complex between the Tyrus and the PARC-1 was by using a technology called BLI, Biolayer Interferometry. Uh, and so what we did is we attached a biotin molecule to our Tyrus protein, and then we bound it to pipette tips. And how you would try to find the most stable complex is you would dip uh, the pipette tips with the Tyrus protein attached into different well plates. So one with just the PARP1 solution, one with the PARP1 solution and resveratrol, one with PARP1 and different DNA, and one with PARP1 and just a lot of other stuff. And so you could see in which conditions uh, the complex would form best. And this was kind of the next step uh, after I left the lab. And what you see up at the top left is the three different plasmids that we purified to try to find the basically the most pure uh, version of Tyrus. So there was the full-length Tyrus, uh, the Y341A mutation, which should bind better to the PARC1 than just the regular full-length, and then also the MINI, which is a shortened version of the Tyrus protein. Uh, and that is a negative control in this experiment. It should not bind to the PARC1 at all. So plasmid construction was another thing that I was tasked to, uh, to do uh, during my time at Scripps. And so, basically, with the modern technology that we have, the computer programs, it's very easy to construct something like this. You just enter, you enter a lot of uh, DNA pairs, and then you order it from a company, and they can actually send it to you. And so I was trying to construct the, each of those plasmids I mentioned, the full-length pyrus, the y 341 a mutation, and also the mini. And then, once you receive the plasmids, you have to purify them so that you actually have just the uh, protein that you're looking for, or the DNA that you're looking for. Uh, so first you induce it in some cells, in an E. coli cell, or many E. coli cells. The next step is the nickel column purification. So basically you run it through a nickel column to, to purify uh, the to purify the protein itself and so that you get only your target protein. And then the final step is actually finding if you found your target protein, uh, which is this gel filtration purification. And so you see on the image on the left how that actually works. The large molecules will elute first because they won't, have, they won't get tangled in the filtration, and the smaller molecules will elute last. And so you see that second peak is where we got a lot of protein. And then what you do is you run it through what's called an SDS page gel uh, to see if you have the correct length or the correct size of your protein. And so you see those uh, dark blots at the correct uh, size that they're looking for so we know that we obtain the correct purified version of the protein. So in summary, uh, I did a lot of things at Scripps, but really what they're looking for me to tell you in this presentation is that it's not, it's not hard to get an internship and to be involved in something that you're interested in. This was, uh, yes, complicated, yes, uh, technical, but I didn't know that much about this before I actually you know, engaged in the program at Scripps. What I learned is that people in labs are really helpful, they're really nice, and if you, they know you're a novice, and so basically they will tell you how to uh, understand all of these things by the end of your time there. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge everyone in my lab, uh, Hai Pong, uh, Dr. Guo, Scripps Research Institute, and then Mrs. Saliga for allowing this presentation to happen. Thank you. Okay, next up is Marissa Marino, who interned for two weeks this, for the past two summers at South Dixie Animal Hospital, which is a hospital for both exotic and domestic animals. She will be talking about her experience with both types of animals, including monkeys, snakes, foxes, cats, and dogs. Come on up, Marissa.
actually have kind of took a different route. Um, instead of talking about DNA, chemicals, I worked like with the animals and um, helped them through different processes. So. Um, so I worked at the South Dixie Animal Hospital. Um, I interned there for a week this summer and last summer. Um, through this hospital, there were two different doctors. There was Dr. Barton and there was Dr. Bennett. Dr. Barton worked with the domestic animals, such as cats, dogs, birds, um, snakes. And um, Dr. Bennett worked with more of the exotic animals, such as elephants, um, monkeys, anything you can possibly think of. <laughs> so what did I do? Um, I mostly observed, um, but I also helped with their tools and helping um, with the processes. Um, basically, um, I ex like the differences between the different ways I helped them was I distributed um, anesthesia and I watch and monitor the levels to make sure that the dogs weren't in um, any pain when the sur surgeries were happening. The difference between anesthesia and twilight drug is anesthesia knocks out the dogs and cats entirely and the twilight drug just makes it so that they stay awake but they aren't receptive to pain or um, any other sources of like feeling that could wake them up. So some things that can wake them up though are lights and like different nerve impulses. So when a dog is hit in the nerve of his tooth, he can jump up and be woken up and be in full like reception. And so he can um, attack the uh, doctor at any moment under this drug if he responds to any kind of light or um, any pain, anything that can cause him to feel uncomfortable. Um, there are different like personal projects. So for instance, there was one kitten that came in. Um, the cat had licked um, some antifreeze. If you don't know what that is, that is um, in a car, it helps with the AC. Um, the cat, when they lick it, it responds to a portion of their brain that allows for them to um, not know what way is up, what way is down, not know where they are entirely. So the cat was moving its head, its eyes couldn't stay straight, and it, it was very detrimental to the cat. Um, There's no way that they could have fixed this, so we actually had to like have to put the cat to sleep. Um, so if you do have an outdoor cat, just make sure it stays away from antifreeze. Um, there's also another case with a kitten where its internal organs were protruding out of its body. So we had to basically put its organs back in and suture it up and um, cap it. So that cat actually lived, but it was abandoned by its mother. Um, so it ended up having fleas, ear mites, everything you can think of. So personally, like I had to go through and fix this cat and find it a home. So that was pretty cool to do. So these are pretty gory, I know. Um, but I just wanted to explain some parts of it. Um, for the spading of a cat, <laughs> You just have to make sure that all the blood vessels are away from um, the area that you are like going at. You have to cut with a small incision and then you have to tie off its um, uterus and make sure that it's cut off so that the cat can't get pregnant, go in heat, um, anything. And then the dog is basically the same thing except the, without taking out the uterus, you're taking out the testicles. So. Um, so this instance is one of the domestic instances. Um, this dog came in with a twisted stomach. So if your dog eats standing up or if your dog runs around after eating, it can eventually twist its stomach. So both ends of it are locked off and the stomach cannot like let go of any gas, any um, anything that can be disposed and the stomach will just keep expanding like a balloon until it eventually pops. And when a stomach pops, it could be very dangerous for the dog because all the acid, all the bacteria, it's deadly for the dog. So the only way you can fix this is um, in younger dogs, you can go through surgery and go in and manually untwist the stomach. But in older dogs, like in this case, the dog was very old and in his last year, so we couldn't go through the surgery. We had to 
get a pole and stick it through and expand the esophagus so that we could release the gas in the um, vial manually. So we had to tilt the dog like this and just like release it. The dog ended up living, but we couldn't find a pole that was small enough to go through the stomach at first. So we almost had to put the dog to sleep, which was a very close call for the owner. Um, so this one's one of the cool ones. Um, we had to do a C-section on a stillborn monkey. So the monkey came in, the mom came in, and um, the baby died during natural birth. So because baby monkey's skulls are just like human skulls, they're very fragile and weak, and they're just like, some of them can't just go through manual natural birth. And this monkey ended up splitting its skull during the natural birth. And so we had to go through um, the C-section. We had to cut the monkey out and just so that the mother could live. So the, you could see like how devastated the mother was afterwards. And it was really human-like to see like the connection between the, the baby monkey and the mom and how upset she was when she knew that the monkey was never to be found. So. Um, this one, if you don't know what an enema is, it's when someone's really constipated and <laughs> they can't like surpass their food. Um, so we had to stick a syringe um, into the monkey's butt. And <laughs> basically, you put in a lot of like fluid so that it can release the contraction. So the monkey had eaten three huge rocks and you could see it. The, I mean the monkey, <laughs> the snake had eaten three huge rocks and you could see a giant bulge around the snake where you could see like there was no coming out of that. Um, you had to end up, it ended up coming out, but it was just like how you would expect it. Once we gave the enema, the um, tissue was weaker, so you could actually push through the rocks. It was pretty disturbing, but. <laughs> so this is um, the fennec fox. So fennec fox have actually become like a common household pet. They're actually really cool, except they kind of remind me of a cat, except they eat insects, which is kind of gross. But the fox has huge ears, which are like way bigger than its head. And the tail is just the same size. It's the tail and the ears are the two things that just like are so big on the animal. So this dog, or this fox, got bitten by a dog. And um, all on its spine and back, you could see that it was going to be scarred. And it was actually stitched up. So this part, I only witnessed the laser. So you had to go through just to make sure that there was no infection and the healing process was right. Um, so within two weeks, I witnessed all of these things. It was a very fun experience and different from anything I've ever done. Um, some things nobody, have, like no normal person will ever see. So it's cool to do these types of internships to understand things that like most, most people don't get to see in their life. And so for me, it was very, that's it. Thank you. Okay, next up is Cole Rosen, who participated in the three week Explorations in Genetics and Molecular Biology program at Columbia University in New York. He attended lectures and performed laboratory experiments in order to explore how DNA works and how scientists can alter DNA for a variety of purposes. Through these experiences, he was exposed to the world of scientific research and college academics. Cole, come on up. Good morning. Um, so this summer, I spent three weeks studying at Columbia University in New York City. Um, I took the course called Ex Exploration to Genetics and Molecular Biology, which was taught by Columbia professors. Um, it focused on scientific research and it featured laboratory experiments, lectures, and uh, a midterm and final exam. So this is Columbia University. Um, if you can see the laser pointer. This is Columbia's campus. It's right in New York City. Um, so it's an amazing experience because you can get to experience all of New York, go to Times Square, um, this is my hall that I stayed in. This is called Fernald Hall. This is one of the many freshman dorms on Columbia University. And this is um, one of the buildings that I had my classes in. This is called Shermerhorn Hall. And this is where my laboratory classes were. 
So each morning we would have lectures. They were taught by a Columbia professor named Dr. Frank Chula. Um, they were in the building called Hamilton, which was obviously dedicated to Alexander Hamilton. Um, so we had a small uh, lecture room um, where in, in the morning these lectures were directly correlated to what we did in the afternoon, um, which was the lab portion of the day. So for No, it's okay. So, um, so um, for example, one morning we would learn about genetic engineering and how to insert um, genes into different organisms. So then that afternoon, we would go to our lab and we would actually do that experiment. Um, so this was the building that I showed earlier, Shermer Horn, and this was Columbia, the lab at Columbia University. Uh, this is the main lab on campus. Um, you can see my professor here, Dr. Hazen. Um, and so in the afternoon, we did a bunch of labs to um, learn about DNA and scientific research and how uh, genetic engineering works, how GMOs work, and other stuff like that. So the first lab we did, this was on the first day, it's kind of a simple lab, it was DNA extraction. So we used these um, little cups filled with Gatorade. Um, you swash around in your mouth to extract DNA cells um, from your cheeks, um, and then you mix it with this uh, solution of detergent and ethanol, as seen here, the ethanol and the detergent are separate. So the ethanol um, almost pulls the DNA out of the detergent solution, so you can see these strings of DNA. And then using a syringe, we were able to extract the DNA and put it into this little uh, microcentrifuge uh, tube that we were able to wear around our necks for the duration of the program. <laughs> um, so then uh, another lab that we did was studying the genetics of fruit flies, the common fruit fly. So um, through this experiment, we looked at three generations of fruit, fly, fruit flies. We had our um, initial generation, which is our parent generation, which was um, wild and mutated fruit flies. So this is a uh, wild fruit fly. And we crossed the wild and mutated fruit flies to study their genetics, um, the different chromosomes, and which chromosomes are sex-linked. So we were able to determine not only uh, which traits are recessive and dominant, but which traits are um, attached to the X chromosomes, how far apart those chromosomes are, and um, how common it is to inherit certain traits. And what's really interesting about this uh, lab is rather than using a traditional fly anesthetic, we use this thing called a fly bed, um, which connects to a container of carbon dioxide gas, and it, set, it pumps carbon dioxide through this bed, and it's a sheet that has many little holes in it, and it um, slowly pumps carbon dioxide, which keeps the flies asleep so you can study them under the microscope. Uh, the other lab we did was uh, gel electrophoresis, which um, we used to study DNA sequencing, which is basically um, determining the precise order of nucleotides in a strand of DNA. So what we did is we took a sample of DNA and we separated it into four uh, test tubes. And then we put uh, different uh, nucleotides in each test tube and these were modified with a dye molecule attached so we could uh, identify them later on. Um, and what we did is after adding the nucleotides, it interrupts the process of DNA synthesis so it leaves the DNA strands incomplete with the DNA molecule that is modified to have the dye molecule um, at the end. So what we did is we combined all those four samples and we ran it on a gel, which is basically a solution of agar. And what you do is um, you, put, you attach it to this uh, basically electrical current machine. Um, and since DNA is negatively charged, it's attracted to the positive current, the positive electrode. So the DNA runs through the gel and the shorter strands are able to move uh, more quickly so they go closer to the positive electrode, whereas the longer strands stay closer to these wells. And then after that, you're able to uh, take your gel and put it through a special light, which allows us to see the special uh, uh, dyed uh, molecules so then we can determine the exact sequence of nucleotides in the strand of DNA. Uh, the final lab we did was uh, gene insertion and replica painting. So this was what I was talking about earlier um, about genetic engineering. So this is how GMOs work and how um, introducing foreign genes into a specific organism. So the one we did is we uh, isolated the human insulin gene and injected it into a bacteria of E. coli. So the way this works is you first have to isolate the human insulin gene and remove the introns. Then you mix it with a specific plasmid. And then after doing that, you can uh, add it to a sample of E. coli, but then you have to add calcium ions and heat in order for them to bind. However, 99% of the E. coli will not take in the plasmid. So in order to separate the um, E. coli that contains the human insulin gene with, those, with the ones that don't, you have to put it on a plate of tetracillin, which, uh, which allows the uh, E. coli to grow that has the plasmid or a construct, but not the E. coli that doesn't. So then we do that, but however, the construct doesn't contain the human insulin gene, only the plasmid. So then we have to do the process of replica plating, where we take a sterile cloth and basically make an exact replica of the, of the colonies 
on the tetracycline plate and we put it, move it to an ampicillin plate. And on this plate, only the bacteria containing the human insulin gene can grow, not the construct. So we're left with a colony of E. coli that can produce human insulin. So other things throughout the program it wasn't just all science and uh, studying. We got to take class trips, so we went to museums to explore DNA and the history of scientific research. Um, you could also take RA trips. RAs are residential advisors. These were trips that were led by the, the Columbia students who lived in the dorms with you. Um, some of these trips included visits to Times Square, um, seeing shows on Broadway, or going to some of the famous restaurants in New York. Um, you also had full campus access. You got to access the gym, the cafeteria, all the buildings. So you got to really experience what it was like to be a freshman at Columbia University. Um, and you also go to educational seminars and college admission and application assistance. So these seminars were in between your morning and afternoon class. And they really showed you, they were arranged for a variety of topics. And they showed you how to write college essays, how to apply to Columbia, how to select a major, um, really educational things that helped with the college process. So I really encourage anyone interested in science or scientific research to do a program like this or one similar because it's an amazing experience and it really does help prepare you for college. Thank you. Okay, our last speaker is Jeff Moody, who spent three weeks over the summer researching and restoring damaged coral reef structures throughout the Florida Keys. Uh, achieving his open water diving certification, he worked at the Coral Restoration Foundation in Key Largo to study the causes and patterns of coral growth, disease, and death across a myriad of reefs throughout the Keys. Jeff helped to research and restore these vital parts of our ecosystem. Come on up, Jeff. possess an amazing natural landscape. We have the most offshore shallow reefs in the entire United States and the world's third largest barrier reef, the aptly named Florida Reef. We have over 100 species of coral and 1,100 species of fish, and several endangered species like manatees, sharks, dolphins, and turtles. Uh, the computer says working on updates, 88% complete. Uh, that's interesting. I don't know how I'm doing this then. So, Coral reefs provide us with aesthetic, env environmental, and economic benefits. Billions of dollars are raised each year in the commercial fishing, diving, and tourist trades. Even tiny Monroe County is able to support 1,600 families with its fishing industry. Now, the biology corals themselves, there are over 2,550 species of corals in the world. But we like to divide them down into two main categories, hard corals and soft corals. Hard corals, like elkhorn and staghorn, or reef building corals. As they grow, they grow exponentially and attract other animals like fish to the reef. Soft corals, like sea fans and anemones, aren't reef building. They aren't as attracted to these other animals, and they don't really help to the growth of the reef. Now, coral themselves are actually a hive of tiny animals known as polyps, the right image there. These polyps act like a cell in a larger organism, growing and dividing and giving nutrients to the entire being. Coral also works in a symbiotic relationship with a type of bacteria known as zooxanthellae. They provide the zooxanthellae with shelter. In return, the zooxanthellae bacteria gives the coral their color and, more importantly, the nutrients they need to survive. So what's killing our coral? The main culprit that's killed so much of the wildlife on this earth, global warming. As carbon emissions rise in the air, our oceans absorb some of that carbon causing the acidity to, pun intended, dive. As the water becomes more acidic, yeah, it was a bad joke. As the water becomes more acidic, it makes the zooxanthellae flee from the coral, leaving the coral bleached, in a term called coral bleaching, white and completely lifeless. In other words, it slowly starves the coral to death. So, working hand in hand with a local re Floridian conservation group, the Coral Restoration Foundation, or CRF, Myself and 15 other teenagers worked over the course of three weeks to research and restore several keys, several coral reefs throughout the Keys, with a focus on Key Largo and Duck Key. Our first week was spent as an introduction to our training, diving, and the Keys themselves. We spent several long classroom hours with the CRF training for our tasks in the weeks ahead, 
We also earned our open water dive certification in four days, normally weeks long ordeal, and took a fish identification course and a course in, course in invasive species. By the second week, we'd actually begun our work in the Keys. Each morning, we go to the marina where the CRF would divide us up into groups of three to four. We then go down to the nursery and begin cleaning the trees, more on those later, taking data samples and taking coral samples for outplanting, more on that later as well. Data was collected using tags that were attached to each coral sample. These tags would indicate estimated weight and size for that week. So the nursery is just an amazing sight to hold. Imagine several football fields in end filled with nothing but coral samples growing. This nursery is populated by a series of PVC pipe and buoy structures called trees, named that way because they kind of look like Christmas trees. Each tree has anywhere from 50 to 200 coral samples hanging on it, mostly elkhorn and staghorn with the occasional piece of hammer coral in there. However, even in this protected environment, there are still threats to the coral, primarily bivalves, algae, and fire coral. This can take over a tree and slowly strangle off the, the uh, coral growing there from the nutrients it needs. So, after going to the nursery, we then go to a couple reefs pre-selected that day by the CRF. The CRF would pick reefs that they, where they saw coral bleaching and zoosanthia disappearance. We'd dive down, splitting into our groups again, and begin outplanting the coral we'd collected that day. Along our way, we'd check on coral groups that had been previously outplanted by other groups to see how they were getting on in this new environment. The process, the process of outplanting a coral is taking coral collected from the nursery and adding it to a defunct or dead coral reef. This has three main stages. First, using a hand pickaxe, you clear away any algae from the reef. If any algae remains, it can actually physically force the coral planted off the reef, leaving it to drift off and die. Secondly, you spot the coral to the reef using something called the three points of contact method. The idea is the coral wants to be sitting on the reef at least three different ways to maintain maximum stability. And finally, using a marine epoxy, kind of like an underwater concrete, you attach the coral sample to the reef. After attaching about 12 samples, you resurface with your group, get a fresh tank of air, a fresh set of reef corals, and head on to a new reef. So over the course of three weeks, that's what aquatic jet looks like, by the way. <laughs> over the course of three weeks, we collected significant data from hundreds of data samples that show that coral grown in the nursery is actually growing better and faster than ever before. We attribute this to two main factors. Water temperature, increased water temperature actually makes coral grow faster, and they picked the spot for the nursery specifically for its high temperatures, and two, human conservation efforts. We cleaned out the entire nursery and outplanted hundreds of coral samples across a myriad of reefs, specifically Snapper's Ledge, Pickles 1, 2, and 3, and French's Reef. Also, there was one day where the uh, stormy conditions prevented us from going out, so we went and rebuilt a bird sanctuary. Completely unrelated to coral. So what can you do to help? First and foremost, educate others about what's going on with this fragile environment. Do what you can to help. If we all pitch in and do our little part, we can accomplish amazing things for ourselves and this fragile part of our seas. In conclusion, Global warming, specifically ocean acidification, is killing our coral. However, data suggests that coral grown in the nursery is growing healthier and faster than ever before and is staying that way in the reefs it's planted in. Our natural coral reefs are an important part of our national landscape, economically and environmentally, and we must do all that we can to protect this fragile environment. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and have a nice day. All right, thank you to the uh, student interns. Uh, one, for just sort of showing what's possible when you follow up on interests and, uh, and extraordinary uh, breadth of uh, experiences, and thanks for sharing those. Larger audience, thanks for uh, uh, holding in there. It's a, it's, it's a long period, obviously, and, and, but these were, uh, these were wonderful, uh, wonderful pieces. Now, what we've done while you were here, we uh, flipped the classes a little bit. The, the schedule is good. We're going to take three minutes off. Lunch doesn't change. So just right now, let's go by the usual class dismissal and head to your next class. And uh, uh, faculty, you'll get a new uh, time schedule as we start. So thank you all. Seniors, you're off.